Hey, Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to our special exposed fake news agenda. Today, we're going to take some time to talk about how the media is awful. Now, we're not going to spend too much time on examples. You already know. I want to get more into the why. What's going on? What's motivating the people in the media, the reporters, the anchors, the executives? And what can we do to stop being manipulated by them? I think maybe the first thing we need to realize is that we're all addicted to it. We're addicted to it. We're addicted to it all. And I don't like being addicted to anything. I don't like anything or anyone else having a hold over me. And with the media, we've become so used to being bombarded nonstop, we become desensitized to it. And like any other addiction, we need more and more and more and more and more. It's got to be constant. And the more outrage you feel about one thing, right, it's, it's, you got you to get more outrage to feel the same high and dopamine hit as you did in the other time. And that all gives us this false sense of being productive and meaningful. And it's all manipulation. There's a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he has a section here. And it's about food. But I thought it applied actually pretty good to, to what we're talking about here. Uh, so if you could just jump to the, the second paragraph here. Uh, companies spend millions of dollars to discover the most satisfying level of crunch in a potato chip, or the perfect amount of fizz in a soda. Entire departments are dedicated to optimizing how a product feels in your mouth, a quality known as oro sensation. French fries, for example, are a potent combination, gold and brown and crunchy on the outside, light and smooth on the inside. Other processed foods enhance dynamic contrast, which refers to items with a combination of sensations like crunchy and creamy. Imagine the gooiness of melted cheese on top of a crispy pizza crust or the crunch of an Oreo cookie combined with its smooth center. With natural, unprocessed foods, you tend to experience the same sensations over and over. How's that 17th bite of kale taste? After a few minutes, your brain loses interest and you begin to feel full. But foods that are high in dynamic contrast keep the experience novel and interesting, encouraging you to eat more. And here's the key. Ultimately, such strategies enable food scientists to find the bliss point for each product. The precise combination of salt, sugar, and fat that excites the brain and keeps you coming back for more. This uh, neuroscientist says we've gotten too good at pushing our own buttons. The bliss point. That idea, it's, I mean, it's ama we, we have the, the media button pushers <laughs> have gotten too good at pushing our buttons. And you have to be intentional if there's any chance on pushing back. We have been programmed by companies to, to like certain things that aren't real. Like an Oreo cookie isn't real, it's engineered. And our brains have just been overloaded by it. The way, way, way too much sensation. We just need to slow it all down and desensitize everything we do. And the media is the same way. They've, they've figured out our bliss points. The media knows exactly what fires us up, exactly how to appeal to the worst inside of everyone. And the media knows how to divide us. And in a moment that should have seen unprecedented unity in a country, the media came in and made everyone go back to their corners and fight it out, made sure to, to get us in a good old-fashioned race war, and it wasn't necessary at all. We need to be repulsed by the people and the forces that do this to us and not be manipulated by them any longer. So that's why we're here today, exposed fake news agenda. We're going to talk to a media reporter who can help us set the stage at the different players involved. We're going to talk to a, um, an author about populism and how the elites, the coastal elites in our cities, they, they think different than most people. And, and there's manipulation there. And then also, with a, finally, with a social psychologist on, on what all of this bombardment does to our brains and our souls. That's all coming up next, exposed fake news agenda. Spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders, welcome back to our special Exposed, the Fake News Agenda. I want to go to Joe Concha for his insight. He's the media reporter at The Hill. Joe, how are you, brother? I'm doing repetitively. I don't know how to answer that question anymore. <laughs> I had to ask Alexa yesterday because my, my daughter asked me, how long have I not been able to go to school? She's six. Good question. 82 days. 
I have yet to leave wow. this house to even go inside a store. So I, I, that's the only way I, I answer that question, Mike. I'm stealing that hands <laughs> I'm doing repetitively on this Blur's Day. Um, okay, I want to talk about motives and narratives and big picture stuff, but first, just give us one example, like the most egregious example of late, or like the first one that comes to your mind of just media being ridiculous against Trump or in any way. Oh, it's a tie, actually, between two CNN anchors, and I still can't believe that they have that title. They're clearly opinion hosts. You can even say activists, and they're in prime time, no less. So that's Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon. Don Lemon actually compared looting and violence to the Boston Tea Party. In other words, if you go into a Foot Locker and take a pair of Nikes, then that's like what happened in Boston years ago when we were fighting uh, for our freedom from the British. That was a doozy. Uh, but then also you had Cuomo just on Tuesday night saying, asking the question actually, show me where protests are supposed to be peaceful and uh, also not violent. Um, well, wait a minute. <laughs> and I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, so excuse me. Oh, polite and peaceful no, is exactly what he said. Yep. Uh, look, uh, the First Amendment actually says, yes, you have the right to assemble peacefully, uh, or, or but, but there's nothing about, you know, actually looting and actually going through everything that we're seeing in American cities across the country, uh, just horrifically on our screens. And you seem to have now two CNN anchors that are actually trying to kind of justify it in some way where there is no justification. What happened to George Floyd was horrific. Everybody agrees that, yes, he should have been charged with murder. He has been charged with murder. The president has condemned it. Uh, and, and I don't quite know what else anybody has to do. Let people obviously yeah. protest. There are grievances. There are problems, uh, clearly, with some rogue cops. But at the same time, to now justify the violent part of what we're seeing on our screens as somehow something revolutionary is utterly ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, the point that a week ago, these same people in the media were talking about how if you want to get your hair cut, you're going to kill grandma, you're a horrible person, blood on your hands. And now that's all out the window. So I want to Can go bigger picture here. Second? Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand what happened where even just a week and a half ago, you had reporters out there mask shaming people in outdoor settings that are clearly social distancing for not wearing masks. And look, I, I completely respect it. My wife's an ER doctor. She sees COVID patients. So when they said stay home or when they said wear a mask when, you know, you're uh, you're in an indoor uh, place, uh, all those things, wash your hands. Yes, almost everybody did that. But now it's like it's completely gone away because the cause is bigger than the virus. Well, well, how is that exactly? I get why people are angry, as I just said. But at the same time, the virus is still there, right? And for now, for people in the media to somehow say, you know what? Because it's a protest, you're allowed no longer to not social distance, which I don't think is actually a sentence. You, you don't have to social distance anymore. Uh, you know, I see people hugging, walking arm in arm. I see reporters uh, getting you know yelled at right in their face. So this is going to be a big test now, right, Mike? I mean, either this thing is able to jump from one person to another outside uh, in these sort of situations, or maybe we'll learn that maybe this is just more than an indoor disease, one that's primarily affected mm -hmm. nursing homes all along. Uh, well, we'll see. Yeah. It's, it's a horrible experiment, but I mean, that's, that's yeah. to be what's happening. But no one's mm -hmm. covering the fact that suddenly coronavirus is gone because there's a bigger story out there now. It's amazing. Uh -huh. Matt, like the virus cares what you're marching for. Uh, Matt Walsh yeah. made a great thread of all the articles about people wanting to go out during the, uh, the lockdown. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel said protesting, or uh, uh, these are protesting like the lockdowns. Protesting is suicidal. Uh, it's racist against black people. It's devastatingly worrisome, reckless, mind-bogglingly selfish. Protesters don't care about lives. Uh, protesters are like typhoid Mary. It's, uh, they're worsening the crisis. They're risking your health, blah, 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 blah. And now all of a sudden, it's not a thing at all. Um, Joey, so in your experience, who's, this is a big question, who sets these narratives? You know what I mean? Like, there's not a cabal of like five people who decide this stuff. Where does it come from? I think the anchors or the hosts have all the power right now. When you hear of like executive producer, you hear that sort of title. And this is not any disrespect to your current executive producer is probably watching the <laughs> control room right now. But I, I think a lot more now, simply an anchor will go on the air and just decide through social media uh, what, what the basic uh, temperature is of that person's particular audience. So I, I look at Nicole Wallace, for instance. She's on MSNBC now, also has the title of anchor, which is just extraordinary. She was a uh, she was actually director of communications in the Bush White House, right? 
So big Republican. She actually was the one who handled uh, Sarah Palin and her campaign, if you remember, in 2008. Okay, so she's probably conservative, you would think, or at least right-leaning. And then she gets to MSNBC, and suddenly you can't find a more staunch critic of the president. So uh, I see this whole pattern now with never Trumpers, right? Uh, Anna Navarro or Rick Wilson, or all these people that are on the air that all are anti-Trump, yet you look at Trump's poll numbers within party and it's over 90%. So the perception is they're all against Trump. To answer your question, mm. uh, as far as how the narrative is set, I really do think that social media actually sets it. And I think a lot of people that are on the air are constantly scrolling through their mentions to see what happened after a segment and if they go against the grain in any way and they give people uh, what they should hear instead of uh, the comfort food, uh, what they want to hear, then they get staunchly criticized. I say, oh, my God, I'm, I'm alienating my audience. What am I going to do? When the, but the bottom line is that when you play the contrarian and you actually just are authentic and give an opinion regardless of what people think about it, those are the most p interesting people on the air right now. Uh, Charlemagne the God. Of, you know, it was you know, has a radio show in New York. He has done the best political interviews of anybody I've seen since this campaign began because he actually challenges yeah. Democrats, despite the fact he probably uh, votes Democrat. And we saw what happened with Joe Biden last week when he interviewed him. So the, the people setting the narrative, I, I think they're probably the mo the highest rated people at various networks telling audiences uh, what they want to hear. And therefore, yeah. that means in this case, That's right. hey, the looting's not all that bad, and uh, we should support them because of X, Y, Z, like I laid out before. And then sourcing their information, as you said, through social media and Twitter, which isn't real life at all, right? That has its own super perverse incentives that isn't real. So they're amplifying this. That's Wow, what a, what a messed up system it is. So let me, let me you kind of touched on this a little bit. Speak to and help us understand the motivations of an anchor um, when it comes to the power they have and like, like what are their incentives to act the way they are and not act like Charlemagne the God or like a Joe Rogan or even like a Tucker Carlson who spent 26 minutes the other day challenging conservatives too. Why, why don't more people do that? What's motivating these anchors to just be hacks? <laughs> Yeah, and I should have mentioned Tucker as well, because you're right, uh, just a couple nights ago, 26 minutes of a monologue that you think, okay, did he go off on Biden, Democrats, Democratic leadership, Cuomo? Now, a lot of it was directed towards Jared Kushner or Nikki Haley or even the president himself, in addition to uh, other people that you would expect a Tucker Carlson who's conservative to go after. And it was one of the more compelling things that I've seen in television in quite some time because no one got a pass. So you would think some people would kind of catch on to that whole thing and say, ah, Ah, okay, if I'm just honest in my convictions and I don't kowtow to one particular side, I might be a little bit more interesting to listen to. And again, it's, it's got to come from in here. You've you got to believe what you're saying. And I, I believe that Tucker yes. believed what he was saying. You know what Tucker Carlson doesn't do, Mike, by the way? Isn't on Twitter. Right, He's not on there all day, like you see a Cuomo or a Tapper. And I think by staying out of that swamp right, and that thought process, which is not real life, as you mentioned, I, I think that, that certainly helps him. So uh, to, to answer your question, yeah, I would think more people would go down that route, but they don't because they are on Twitter and they are scared of the backlash. And I think wow. the motivator ultimately to answer your question also is love. They want to be loved and they want verification that they exist and they matter. And you do that by telling people what they want to hear. Wow, they want, let's, let's touch on that. They want to be loved. They want, they want the accolades. They want, they want what? They want, continue that, that's, really, that's, that's good. They want a lot of retweets and they want a lot of likes. And when they get those, they feel like that gets them somewhere. Maybe it gets them to their next contract as well. So maybe there's yeah. a money factor involved. I remember, you know, I was very, very young, but uh, one of the first things that I was exposed to in, in media that I really found interesting, I was probably like eight years old, which is a little bit weird, uh, but Howard Cosell, was once voted the most loved and hated man in America. I believe that was like 1980, right? And this is when he's at the peak of Monday Night Football and he even hosted his own uh, talk show and, and, and all this stuff. And it was because Howard just said things uh, that he genuinely believed that that he and he didn't care what anybody thought. And, and Howard Stern was like that for a while as well. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, that could be a great yeah. thing, but too many people are afraid also, not just the love part, but also what is the executive uh, in that corner office uh, that, that that's running my network gonna think when I go against what was in the morning editorial meeting as far as the way we're gonna go about the story. Okay, well, yeah, that's, that's a different question. So, so is it, are these motivations mostly led by the anchors, you think? Or is there, are these the suits higher up who are making these big decisions too? 
I, I think it's a combination, right? Uh, but I think ultimately, even the executives only have about the same power as the people that are bringing in uh, the folks to, to, to watch the network, right? Um, I think you see that with Fox News. I think that Roger Ailes was certainly like, a, a obviously, the, the most influential, uh, most successful, uh, put his personal uh, stuff aside, you know, which, which obviously was horrible. But um, he, he knew how to run a network, no question about it. And he ran things there at Fox, if you read everything that, that, that I've read. Uh, and when he said, okay, this is the direction we're going to go in, that's what we're going to do. Now I think it's a much more even playing field uh, in terms of, and I'm not just saying Fox, I'm saying everywhere, where uh, each each anchor, each host uh, probably has as much power as the guy who has the title of president uh, next to their name uh, at a particular network. Uh, last question for you. These, they these anchors. Too, by the way, Mike. <laughs> they probably get yeah. paid more. That, that's everything, right? Uh, last question. So these anchors, let's take like a Rachel Maddow or whoever, right? How do they view themselves in the in the world, right? Like, do you, do you think a lot of these people are tr like I'm a true believer and fighter for the cause, or do you think they're more opportunists and not do whatever it takes to get the likes and get the money? Okay, uh, I, I think that in Maddow's case, she's always been consistent with who she is, and she doesn't have that anchor title uh, next to her name. She's a host. She's an opinion host. She's an activist. And as long as you put that out there, I have no problem with you as a media critic, because at least you're being transparent. The same thing with Hannity, right? I mean, the guy supports the president. He says he wants him to succeed. No, he says, I am not a journalist. Uh, good. When you say those things, that's great. It's the people that say they're objective and say they're out there just asking questions and speaking truth to power when you know when you watch them they clearly favor one side or another uh, that, that that's that's all that matters i mean i'll go back to cuomo again chris cuomo had his brother on uh, a dozen times on his show never once asked him about the nursing home situation in new york that's killed thousands of people remember the nursing home situation was governor cuomo directing that covid 19 patients that test positive go back into their nursing homes which is a death sentence for everybody in there yeah. that is the most missed story of coronavirus we talk about mistakes that were made at the federal level absolutely we talk about it on the local level yes there too it's an unprecedented event people should deserve some slack in that regard but the, the nursing home thing and what do you have here you had the, the governor of new york a democrat going on his brother's show on cnn and they got great ratings for it because it was, you know, like uh, the, the Kardashians, you know, keeping up with the Cuomos. And, and, and yet, you know, not one question about the most important decision that the governor made, that's state-run TV. That's what we should be worried about. Mm. Uh, good stuff. Joe Concha, uh, media reporter at The Hill. Joe, I wish we could talk more. Let's do it again, brother. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate Thanks for your help. You. Yes, and the Twitter is Joe Concha TV, right? I'm I believe it is Joe Concha. Yeah, it is uh, Joe Concha TV if you want to uh, check him out there. True, uh, uh, exposed, fake news agenda. More coming up. Spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders, welcome back to our special exposed fake news agenda. I want to talk to an author of a new book. It's actually coming out in like a week or so. It's called They're Not Listening. How the Elites Created the National Populist Revolution, Ryan Gerdusky. Ryan, how are you, brother? Good, thanks for having me on. My pleasure, good to talk to him. So let's uh, define our terms here first. Um, I think we all have like a kind of like vague idea of populism, but how do you define it? What is it? So uh, nationalism is what we, you would have uh, a group of people oppose uh, international groups, and populism is when maybe lower class people oppose the elites or the wealthy. Um, so when you have national populism, you have a combination and infusion of the two, because really the two have become one. Um, those who live on the coastal elites um, are usually globalists. They believe that borders uh, are, are, don't matter, that people are interchangeable, that, uh, that the world can exist without the functions that it has had for the last 2,000 years. So that's what a national populist is. I, I lay out in the book nine general principles that most national populists believe on a global scale. Uh, everywhere, I mean, because what people forget is that national popul populism is happening on every continent on the globe, in mm. Africa, in South America, in, in, in Asia, uh, as well as Europe and North America. People assume it's just, you know, people in Ohio who voted for Donald Trump. It's much, much larger than that. Hmm. Is it a newer concept or is it as old as man and, and, and institution? 
Uh, well, it's rising, certainly. I mean, if you look at what happened since the 1980s, when when people like Pat, or 1990s rather, when Pat Buchanan and Jean Marie Le Pen, um, and uh, and and many of those people rose into power, not power, but rose into credibility and to public eye. It took 20 years of of the progression of what's been going on in in our in our governments across the globe, and the fact that. We've moved more and more towards what they call post-democratic systems, where people feel like they vote and they vote and they vote, and nothing ever changes because the institutions have embedded themselves in, in, in non-democratic means. And that's what's been happening uh, more and more and more. And also, the, being the biggest factor is immigration. Immigration is the biggest causation for national populism. And Americans have been voting and have been telling pollsters for something like 50 years that they want less immigration and they want to change the way we do immigration and still nothing ever seems to happen. Who are these elites? Well, I think that it's anyone who would live in a coastal Western liberal city. So those who believe in uh, living in a place, those who believe in living in, uh, those who want to live somewhere versus those who could live anywhere. Those who could live in New York or London or Thailand, or sorry, Singapore, uh, they will live anywhere. It's, oh, it's all the same values. They are immune from really uh, domestic chaos. Uh, everything from the 2008 global financial crisis to the Iraq war, um, they didn't feel. They didn't enlist in the military. They didn't sit there and feel the economic uh, uh, fallout from it. They are immune from the regular things that the rest of society is. Those who live somewhere, those who want to live and do live in, in places and cities and communities that they have had four, five, six generations living in, and they believe and they're, they're valued in those communities, they have a completely different relationship to the government than those who could live anywhere do. Okay, hold on. That's brilliant. I've never heard such a thing. Okay, so let me back it up for a second. <laughs> uh, I've been I've been thinking since 2016, really, about the great, I think, the biggest divide in America, and it's country versus city, right? And that goes back thousands of years. Aesop's fables wrote country mouse, city mouse, and we've explored that in a million different ways. Culturally, politically, blah, blah, blah. But I've never thought of this idea of people who could live somewhere versus people who could live anywhere. So first, maybe you could speak to the city-country divide, and then could you give another example of the somewhere, anywhere? I really want to get that point down. Okay, so like those, so let's take the media because that's what we, we were, we, we were uh, discussing yep. is that, um, okay, the media in general, they live in very blue cities. They are overly white, they are overly liberal, they're overly college educated. Uh, they are. They they have certain features, democratic uh, demographically, that are much 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 different than those of the average person. So their world experiences, regardless of of you know if they are a right winger or a left winger, are just immune. Anderson Cooper could be the most fair individual on the planet. He's still the gay. He's still a gay guy from Chelsea who's the son of a billionaire. Um, <laughs> he's going to have a different life experience than, than you or I, and those experiences should count. The amount of people who either live in Trump districts or the amount of people who lived in Romney districts versus Trump districts got much, much smaller. And the media is just one side of the elite. And they can live anywhere. I mean, those who want to live in, how many, how many times do you hear a celebrity sit there and say, well, if this election doesn't go right, I'm just going to move to Canada or to London mm. or to Singapore or to Australia or to uh, maybe Sao Paulo. They are, I, I, actually, I doubt Sao Paulo, but, but they will go <laughs> to any Western liberal city that is organized in the, in, with, the, with those values because they are immune to what's actually gonna happen to a, a, you know, a, yes. a dairy farmer in Northern Wisconsin or a, you know, a truck driver somewhere in Ohio. They just don't have the same exact relationship to politics and to, uh, and, and to the, the government, the way things work that, that you know, the rest of us do. Oh, it's so good. What is it about a city and living in a city that either changes someone or it, does it attract a certain type of person? Which comes first, I suppose? Well, you know, I, I guess it depends on the city. I don't think those who live in St. Louis, Missouri have the same relationship that those who live in New York City do. I'm a born and raised New Yorker. My family's been here for nine generations, so it's a totally different, oh. I think, feel. But those who aspired, I guess, to live in a place and be a somebody and have a certain, uh, you know, air about them are much different than those who want to sit there and live in, uh, in, in a, a, anywhere or live in Kansas City or live in, you know, places that are not, I mean, 
Uh, I mean, in America, it's much different than it is over in Europe or over in South America. A lot of it's a, it's a totally different feature. I think in, in the United States, in the context of America, the post 60s. Uh, white flight structural change after after a series of riots, kind of like we're having now. A lot of people sat there and, and left the city because they they mm. they were afraid. We had high crime rates of the 70s and 80s and 90s, um, and I think that they left the city and moved to the suburbs for their own uh, you know their own protection. So I think you saw a real big change in the dynamic of what is a city. And then in and then after the 2008 financial crisis, when Obama bailed out the rich people, left the poor people to rot. Um, and created the super billionaires, the Michael Bloomberg's of the world. You have basically two classes in a city now. You have the underclass that serve the upper class, and then you have the ultra elite. And that's what's happening in the in the uh, in the uh, Excella corridor from D.C. to Boston. That's what's happening in Silicon Valley. Those who can barely afford to live in these places, and those who can buy, you know, uh, same four homes on a block. Wow, amazing! All right, let's go back to the media. So, what is uh, I don't know if this is the right, like, what's the narrative of the media, I suppose? Like, or maybe ask it like this. Is, is the narrative intentional, or is it just more just passively made because that's who, how these people were raised in their worldview? So let's go to, like, I worked in the media. I worked for the Washington Examiner, and most, uh, most journalists do not have a bad intention. Most journalists, by the way, are never getting rich. If you're a city desk journalist and you're a beat reporter and you're covering everything from unionization to the local town hall meeting, you're never making a lot of money. You're doing it for the passion of the cause. What happened was because how the structure of the media changed so drastically, people became political, people became journalistic brands. Rachel Maddow is a brand. She's not mm. a journalistic brand. You have the choice of sitting there and being a beat reporter and making $50,000 a year and busting your hump and being a great reporter, perhaps. Or you can make several millions of dollars, get book deals, get endorsement deals, get cable news shows, become the next Katie Turr. Doesn't matter what you say, you're not going to be held liable for it. And what happened was the punishment for doing things um, became less and less and less severe. I'll take back Dave Weigel. He's a reporter for the Washington Post. Dave Weigel had emails released saying that he wanted to set Matt Drudge on fire back in the early 2000s. He was fired from his job, went on MSNBC, but by 2000 and I think 12 or 13, it's in the book, he got his job back. Um, when when uh, other reporters sat there and started publicly saying things and never were held to accountability for saying horrible things like i want to punch young conservatives in the face which there was one reporter from the guardian who sat there and tweeted that and they never got fired never got in trouble when the when the punishment became less severe they got away with anything and then when they realized when twitter came along they could become media personalities that's when it you know it all went to hell in a handbasket, and that's when you sat there and saw, yes. you sat there and saw them our opinions even more vocal because they can become brands, and that's what really a lot of journalism is. Don Lemon is not a serious journalist. Rachel Maddow is not a serious journalist. Sean Hannity is not a serious journalist. They are not. They are brands, and they sell to you what your preconceived notion of the world is, and mm. um, and it. That's why also there's a divorce, an increasing divorce between what actually is news and what is part of their brand. And I present to you both RussiaGate and uh, the and the and the school in um, in, in Kentucky, uh, those boys, uh, Covington Catholic School. Yep. Those were fake news stories that they sold because it's part of a brand that they packaged to you, and that is why kind of the journalism has become worse and worse and worse. Not to mention when I said that it's becoming overly liberal, overly white, overly college educated. So it's coming with a certain worldview. So good. And these, so you're saying these people just peddle confirmation bias all day long and make a ton of money off of it. Is that, so is that, I know you, you spoke about they the structure. They, they, don't, they, all, they all don't make a ton of money, but they can, the potential to make money is very, very large. Yes. And that is what they sit there and do. And that's why, I mean, it's, it, listen, if you have the opportunity to make a lot of money and to become famous, there's a lot of there's a lot of push for it. Look at that guy from uh, oh God, I can't remember his name from MS or from CNN or MSNBC who sat there reading the Statue of Liberty poem to Stephen Miller at the White House. They don't they make the stories about them, not about the actual news. April Ryan does that. Most people in the White House press corps do that. That's how they've advanced their careers, and um, it, is, it is it is a strategy right now, a marketing strategy. Um, it's tragic. It's tragic for the actual news, but that is what they sit there and they do. And and also the fact is that how many people who are part of who are journalists today go to church, own guns, drive a truck, listen, or, or, or went, went to a state school or no college at all, mm. and live in a Republican district or a district that went for Trump, or, or, or count that went for Trump? Not very many.
it is a high remember, volume. Remember, remember that tweet that someone sent out? I think it was right after the election, and it was how many? So the reporters out there, do you know anyone who owns a truck? Like the number one, two, and three top selling vehicles in America are pickup trucks. And the media, that, like, does anyone in the media know anyone who owns a truck? And the people in the media got all upset, like, oh, what a ridiculous question. And none of them did, uh, which no. proves your point. When after, the, there's a shooting, after there's a shooting, there is so often that the people in the media cannot even describe what a gun is. They can't decipher yeah. between an automatic and a semi-automatic. They don't know the basics, nor do they know people who even own a gun. And that is just a yeah. divorce from the way the rest of the other country is. And it's just because they are all the same kinds of people living in the same kinds of places. There's not a lot of diversity in a media that loves to sit there and talk about diversity. Yeah, so good. Okay, uh, I got like two more minutes. So I'm, I'm thinking about Simon Sinek's, one of his pieces about uh, how the leaders eat last. And you th I thought of this because accountability, right? You brought up the accountability. And one of the jokes we kind of make on the show a lot is of Donna Brazile and how she fed the, the, the debate questions. And still <laughs> she's like, like, what are we doing? Like, how do these people never face any accountability? Will we, will we ever get accountability back? Or can these people just be wrong all the time forever? You know, I think that you said, well, part of it is the fact that, you know, with media conglomerates are now owned by even bigger businesses. So they don't really face, I mean, they don't, I mean, most the Washington Post, the New York Times for a very long time were nonprofit industries. Most media outlets are not profit. They don't have profitable. Most newspapers are not profitable. Uh, certainly they are, they are projects for very, very wealthy people and wealthy companies to own. So I don't, I don't exactly know how, but uh, it's a great mm -hmm. question. And there's probably an answer that someone smarter than myself can sit there and yeah. figure out. So what, what's your advice to us as we're taking in media to, to not be manipulated or sucked in by what they're well, selling? Well, don't believe in bumper stick and sl uh, sticker slogans, and um, you should probably have more than one outlet. And, I, uh, and, and don't go to maybe more mainstream outlets to sit there and get your only opinion. If you only read the New York Times and sit there and probably get something, go to Quillette, go to uh, a smaller yeah. publication that has a more nuanced worldview that at least challenges your opinion. And and they're all out there now with the internet. That's po the, probably the positive side. Yep. A lot of them don't make a lot of money, but they are worth just checking out. Maybe you can get some more information there. Curate your inputs is the line we use. Yeah. That's the bumper sticker slogan we use here all the time. Uh, <laughs> all right, this is awesome. Ryan, I look forward to reading this very much. It comes out uh, June 16th, so in a couple weeks. They're not they're listening. Not. Yes. Yep, and it's, it's 10 bucks on Kindle. What are we doing? They're not listening. How the elites created the national populist revolution. Ryan Jurassi. Uh Ryan, thank you, brother. Let's talk again. Thank you. Good stuff. More coming up. Exposed fake news agenda. Spread the word. Slater Crusaders, welcome back to our special. I'm really excited to talk to our next guest. We talked to his co-author of his most recent book, John Tierney, the former science writer of the New York Times. We talked to him a few times, uh, and I'm excited to talk to the professor. The book is called The Power of Bad, How the Negativity Effect Rules Us and How We Can Rule It. Uh, professor Roy Baumeister, professor at University of Queensland, social psychologist. Professor, how are you, sir? I'm pretty good. How are you? Good. I'm really glad you're here. I'm glad we can go a little deeper into all this. So John's given us kind of the overview of, of the book. We've talked a lot about negativity bias and all those things. Um, so I want to expand on a couple more themes, if you don't mind. Uh, first, can we just define the merchants of bad? Who, who are and what is the merchant of bad? Okay, well, that was uh, uh, John's term uh, for people who make money by exploiting the, the mind's tendency to focus on bad news and bad things and negative things. Um, so, uh, certainly could include the media, especially the, the media that, that, that feature bad news and, and crises and, and, you know, fan the flames of, uh, of dissent and controversy. Um, could be uh, other people who try to uh, make money by, uh, again, exploiting our fear of danger, um, offer protection services uh, for uh, uh, very remote risks, things like that. Mm. So what, knowing the human's tendency, to say the least, to focus on bad news, what do we do with that? What do, what do I, as a consumer of 
news and I want to know what's going on in the world, what do, how, how do I approach this? Well, our book is basically op optimistic, despite the, the, the title. Uh, we want to say uh, this is a property of, of how the mind works, that it, it reacts, uh, you know, overreacts to negative things relative to positive things. Uh, so just understanding that uh, can already be somewhat calming. And then you can put it to use for you. You can uh, know, for example, that uh, in your work or your relationships or whatever, uh, the most important first thing to do to make things better is to avoid doing bad things. Uh, say in a marriage, uh, the, the negative things people do have a much bigger impact on the course of the marriage than the positive things. You know, And we identify with the positive things we do. I ask my students, why would someone marry you? Why would you be a good uh, husband or wife? Uh, you know, they list positive things, but really it's, can you hold your tongue? Can you avoid the negative things? Can you not waste uh, a whole lot of the family's precious money on some uh, splurge or, or mistake or venture? Uh, avoiding the negative has much more impact statistically uh, than, the, than the positive. And, and, and then constructively, you know, when you realize that the, the world is, is operating based on this quirk of human nature, uh, Make a point. Reach out. Seek out uh, positive stuff. I mean, I have a couple cartoon service, services that send me a cartoon every day. And, uh, you know, sometimes they're dumb, but, you know, I get an, an extra smile out of that. <laughs> Plant uh, positive things in, into your life. You know, go looking for uh, for good news. The, the, the world is really full of plenty of good things, uh, even though that's not what you see when you turn on the, the news. And, and I don't want to blame the media either. I mean, you're in business. Uh, and so you got to give the people what they'll pay for and what they'll want. And, and, and so, again, the consumers have that same uh, quirk of the mind that we, we focus on the bad things. So that's what's going to sell papers and magazines. Yeah, I like that point. It's, yeah, I like that point. It's easy to blame the media, but it's our responsibility to, right, they're, they're just giving what we want and what we Right, watch. So stop watching, is right. the key. and then they'll maybe give us something else. I, I do. I'm okay with putting the responsibility back on us. So uh, I, I think you touched on it, but this idea of a low bad diet. I just want to thank you, Professor. I, I haven't yet, um, because this concept did change my life, and it's changed this show uh, because of that. And I've curated my inputs. It was a term John gave me a couple months ago. I think back in February. So like my Twitter feed is interspersed with things that are going on, like news and people I value, and also architecture and art and just pictures of nature, right? And it's just good for my soul in order to do that. So I love that concept, so I wanna thank you. Um, what, actually, let, let's, let, let me ask that question. What, what happens to your soul when you are just bombarded with negative all the time? Okay, well, soul is not a concept we use in psychology uh, very much. We tiptoe around it, but if you <laughs> use it sort of figuratively to uh, uh, refer to the mind. Uh, um, so your question is, you know, what happens yes. when we're, we're bombarded with this, this negative information? Again, we tend to uh, uh, react to it and, 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 um, and possibly get depressed or upset about uh, things, you get the impression that the world is in much worse shape than it really is. Uh, and again, that, when we did the original scientific research for this, we had all these theories of when there would be exceptions and that the mind would look for good things here and bad things here. And uh, you know, we thought that would really inform the theory. Only we just couldn't find the bad things that, you know, wherever you looked in good day, bad day, and emotions, and memories, and uh, in relationships, as I've said, in business and so on, always it was the basic point: bad is stronger than good, um, mm. and and probably for good evolutionary reasons, uh, as as we say in the book, uh, life has to win every day; death only has to win once. Uh, so you, the, our ancestors who watched out to avoid the bad, they probably survived better than the others. Um, nevertheless. Uh, uh, we shouldn't let it uh, us distort our our view of uh, uh, how how nice life is uh, these times and how much there is uh, to be to be happy about. Uh, so the, op the the opposite question is what happens to your mind when you do have a low bad diet? How does your mind change? 
Well, that hasn't been studied. That's that's our recommendation based on, on our understanding of, of, of the research and the science and, and, and so on. Uh, but uh, at least to get out of this sense of a perpetual doom and, and, and crisis, which, you know, it's so unfortunate for people in modern Western civilization, you know, some of the luckiest uh, human beings uh, in the history of the, the planet, uh, to go around thinking everything is, is, is falling apart and that there are disasters in store and, 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 uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, again, look on, look on the bright side and, and exercise it. And we also notice uh, since bad things have often double, triple, quadruple the impact of good things, you need more good things to win because life is basically good but it's because there are lots of positives so start to notice them and attend to them and uh, uh, let them enjoy it and if you you some people say well I did something bad to my husband or wife so I got to do something nice to make up for it well think I should do four nice things (laughs) Uh, if you get that in your mind yeah, okay, that was bad. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that one. But I'll do four nice things to make it up. Uh, then that'll put you back, you know, in the in the positive sphere uh, and, yeah. and, and so on. Can you... Um, do you have any insight into this idea I've, I've heard about recently, uh, chronocentrism? So it's the idea that the moment you're living in right now is paramount. Like, the... Like, this, like the future of humanity hinges on this thing right here and nothing will ever be the same after this moment. I thought about it a lot during COVID, right? People are like, nothing will ever be the same. And it's like, well, I'm sure they thought the same thing after the Spanish flu in 1918 and we still go to movies and we still have sporting events and we still shake hands, right? Uh, So nothing really changed. (laughs) And I don't know, maybe things probably won't change that much after this, but we still think this is the most important thing ever. Is that tied into this negativity bias at all, you think? Well, no, that would be a separate uh, tendency, and, and, and I suspect not nearly as well documented. Uh, of course, you know, there are spiritual traditions that encourage you uh, to cultivate that kind of awareness, that sort of mindfulness, they call it, of, uh, you know, just focus, you know, be here now. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, there are advantages to that. Uh, I have an extensive research program on how people's thoughts are distributed in, in terms of time, and we find that indeed people's thoughts are the happiest to the extent they focus on right now. Uh, that uh, the more the mind wanders into the past or future, especially into the past, but uh, also into the future, they, these are less happy thoughts. On the other hand, uh, letting your mind cross other time zones into past and future, those are much more meaningful. The future, thinking about the future is particularly meaningful. So there's something of a trade off. Uh, but uh, if you're feeling bad and want to feel better, you know, Get, get your mind right into the here and now. It's usually not as bad uh, as it seems, at least not at this moment. Nice. I, uh, I know you do research on self-control and willpower. Uh, so I'd love to just set you up to talk about that a little bit. First of all, I got little kids and I want them to have self-control. Um, so I'd love your insight there. But I also, we need to have self-control to have a low, bad diet, right? Because we're addicted. We're addicted to this. Like, I need constant... CNN all the time, ah, bring it in, what's the latest one? So how do you have willpower to do the right thing when it comes to low-bad diet? Oh, well, okay, well, thanks for asking. Uh, I had another book on, on willpower that summarized 20 years of research on that. Uh, so I want to understand how it works. Uh, it, it seems that people have a, a limited supply, so you use it up in one thing and you don't have as much for something else. Of course, it replenishes when you eat and, and get a good night's sleep and all those things. Um, so take care of your physical body, then the, the mind in it will also be in, in, in better shape. Uh, you can build up your willpower. You know what, back in the 1800s, they talked about is building character, uh, do little exercises. Uh, they really work. It, it seems like self-control works like a muscle that you know sometimes will get tired after you've been using it. Uh, but uh, with regular exercise, it will indeed uh, make you stronger, build character. Um, so that's important. Uh, I mean, with children, I, I studied self-esteem for a long time, and there was a big bandwagon, you know, you got to worry about kids' self-esteem. And I, 
regrettably come to the conclusion that that's really not well founded that most children already have plenty high self-esteem and unless you're really abusive and tearing them down you're not likely to do much damage and boosting their self-esteem doesn't seem to do much good but boosting their self-control uh will do a lot of good uh it's a gift that keeps on giving it makes it's better for them it's better for society there are studies where they measure children's self-esteem at 10 years old and show that they're uh you know, in their 20s and 30s, they have a better job. They're less likely to be unemployed. They're less likely to be addicted to drugs or smoking cigarettes. Uh, they'll uh, you know, have a better marriage, uh, a better family. Uh, so the benefits go in all directions, and, and I don't really see cost for it. So even just having in your mind, I want my children to have good self-control, I think that already helps quite a bit. Wonderful. What are some, you said build it up. I love that idea of self-control as a muscle. Um, what are some things we can do to build up our self-control, uh, whether it's kids or adults? We can all use more of it. Okay, well, it'd be different with kids and adults. We have a whole chapter in the book on, on what you can do uh, uh, with kids, uh, especially when they're young. You, you set the rules uh, in terms of punishing. You want to be very consistent and very immediate, and then you don't have to be mm -hmm. severe. Severe strict punishment is, is often a reaction because you haven't been punishing lately, and then that, that just confuses the kid because I did this last week and they let, they just laughed and I did the yes. same thing and then they punish me. So it teaches them uh, it's 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 hard to follow. Um, in yourself, uh, people ask me this sometimes around New Year's, uh, what to do about it because New Year's resolutions are ways to improve yourself, uh, but they're notorious for failing. Well, I'm in favor of improving yourself, but we want to do it more effectively. So what I say is, instead, if you understand you have a limited amount of willpower, if you're trying to change yourself in five different ways, they're all pulling against each other. They're all yes, depleting yes. the same pot of energy. So instead, like you're building up a muscle, I say do them sequentially. Start with the weakest. You know, do something that you can do. Make your bed in the morning or clean up after uh, clean up the dishes after dinner or, you know, stop swearing in front of the children. Or, you know, make some small change that you can actually do. And succeeding at that will make you stronger and then move on to the next one. Uh, things uh, they say like, you know, the difficult ones like quitting smoking. Well, you want to build up your, your self-control strength before you get around to that. Uh, because, uh, I'm sorry, I got a little... Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's allowed. Yeah. Uh, no, that is, we we have we actually out of time, Professor Two, and I hate that because I want to. Maybe we can do a whole another day on. Let me check out the book. I want to. What's your self? What's the self control book? It's called Willpower. Understand, uh, rediscovering the greatest human strength. Was a yeah, book. I love that. Okay, I want to read that one, and then maybe we can have you back on, Professor, and we can break it that down in more detail. But uh, in light of media and what's going on today, we're all going to need more willpower too. Um, okay think properly and curate our inputs and have that low bad diet and not let the merchants of bad continue to have their hold on us. And I appreciate you bringing that to our awareness. Uh, Roy Baumeister, The Power of Bad. That's the book you got to get, The Power of Bad, How the Negativity Effect Rules Us and How We Can Rule It. Professor, thanks for your time, sir. Okay, thanks for having me on. Have a wonderful day. We'll do it again. Uh, okay. Study Crusaders, Exposed Fake News Agenda. That's our special. Glad you were here. Have a great rest of your weekend. Spread the word.